Welcome to COC. You guys doing all right? That's some good worship, amen. Awesome, man. Thank you guys so much for uh, choosing Church of Celebration as your place of worship today. If you're a guest of ours, thank you so much. We're honored to have you with us and we're excited to continue in our second uh, week and last week of our uh, beginning New Year series called Mountain Moving Prayers. And did Matt not just do a tremendous job last week? Some of you are like, oh, it's all right. You know what I'm saying? Um, man, we, he, he must have done something right because we already had over 100 people as a part of our prayer team here. Uh, the Hidden Warriors is what we call them. Um, but anyway, over 100. And last week alone, we had over 40 people, 40 brand new people sign up to be a part of our prayer team. That is, they, they are... They are praying behind the scenes at all times. Several of them are even here today on the back rows praying right now for you. And uh, basically, it's a simple thing. We just ask you to pray for the prayer requests that are sent to you as a prayer team member. We ask you to pray for our prayer calendar, which we have something to pray for every single day of every month that gets sent out and delivered to you. And, and, and then also just be available to pray during Sunday services. It's minimal. The least that we can do is pray, and you can be a part of that. And we don't want to leave you out. So today, again, as you maybe come forward when we celebrate communion at the, uh, at the end, you can grab one of the cards uh, that says prayer partners and just put your name and your information on there, bank account, mother's maiden name, and we will get you set up to be a part of our prayer team, or we'll charge you for not being a part of our prayer team. Um, but just ser seriously, just drop it inside the baskets. We would love to have you be a part of that. And how cool is it, as a Ginger said, that we've had over 250 booklets that we have distributed for 21 days of fasting and prayer. <laughs> Tremendous. To the point, to the point in which now we just, hey, listen, they're out. Actually, where we got them, they're, they're out. That's why we couldn't get any more for you. So you gotta get your digital copy. That's an easy, easy process to do that. The information on how to do it, you can even make notes on your digital copies as well. So you can grab those on the stage as well. So please, please, please uh, be a part of prayer. Here's why. At COC, um, and we believe that prayer is, is truly one of the most important foundations uh, of your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Some of you agree. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> Let me tell you something, okay? If you know Jesus today, just shooting straight with you. If, if your prayer life is lacking, it leaves a want to be desired, right? Or, or it's even absent altogether. Can I just tell you that it's gonna be pretty evident that you're gonna struggle with your walk with Jesus Christ. Just shooting super straight with you. Seriously, one of the things that I will ask people in counseling sessions is when they tell me everything that's going on, I will ask them about their personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And when I mean that, I say, tell me about your Bible reading and tell me about your prayer life. And in most situations where life is falling apart, it's absent or lacking desperately. So what we wanna do and what we do every single year as COC, as we start the year specifically talking about how valuable uh, that prayer is in your life. How many of you are doing right now the 21 days of fasting and prayer? Just raise your hand. I, I, I guarantee we could pass a microphone around and you could already be sharing what God is doing in your life that you haven't seen him do in quite a while. It's because you've placed a priority on prayer in your life. You realize that, right? A priority that never or was one that wasn't very high on the priority list. So we want you to grow in your prayer life. And that's what we're after. And that's why we're gonna keep pushing and, and, and celebrating the fact that God has given us a communication with him through prayer. And that's an amazing, amazing thing. Now, Matt did start our series last week and, and he talked about some incredible things. 
But I'll be honest with you, this week and our last week, I'm gonna share with you basically what I believe is the number one reason, the number one reason that many of us use as an excuse uh, um, about our ineffective prayer lives. And that, that reason is time, time. Time seems to be the one thing, and, and it can go for your own, you know, Bible reading, whatever, but, but prayer in particular, time, is, is usually the number one excuse that many people use as to not having an effective prayer life. Albert Einstein once said this. He said, time management is an oxymoron. It can't be managed. You can't save time. You can't lose time, you can't turn back time or have more time tomorrow than you already have today. So contrary to what you may think and use as your excuse for your inactivity in prayer, I just gotta be honest with you today, there really are enough hours in the day for you to have an effective prayer life. You know that, right? Here's why, because God has given each of us the gift that I call 24. It is a gift, not, not, not the TV series that was a phenomenon several years back. That was a really cool show, by the way. But God has given each human being the gift of 24. And if you really wanna go out on a limb, you could say that 24 is actually a theological foundation. It's a theological foundation. And, and, and what we all really know today is, is 24 is God's design of time. And 24 is a gift from God to every single one of us. He's given each of us 24 hours in a day. Now, listen, you, you can slice it however you want, all right? You can make it bigger and say you got 1,440 minutes in a day. If you wanna do that, that's fine. You can say I got 86,400 seconds in a day. But here's what you get every single time with the gift of 24, however you slice it. You still always get a constant, a constant that does not change. We've been given a gift of 24. He doesn't give you more than me and he doesn't give me more than you. He gives us all 24. Time is time and it's given to us in the form of 24, 24. Now, to better grasp the idea of time, because this is kind of a general concept, let's break it down. And you can look at it differently, right? To know the value of one year, all you have to do is ask the student, your child, your teenager, your college student, who just failed their last exam. Then you'll know what the value of a year is. To know the value of one month, just ask the mother who gives birth to a premature baby. To know the value of one week, just ask the editor of a Newsweek magazine or newspaper. To know the value of one day, just ask the wage earner, the single mom who is providing for her six children. To know the value of one hour, just ask your 16 year old who just got their first job and wonder why their paycheck wasn't very big. To know the value of one minute, just ask the person who just missed their plane. To know the value of one second, just ask the person who survived the fatal car accident on 347 because they came up one second behind. And you can even break it down further, right? You, you know, you can value, to know the value of one millisecond, just ask the Olympic silver medalist. Listen, friends, as I attempt to explain the idea of 24 this AM, uh, you need to understand something about me in case you didn't know. And our staff would clearly be able to back this up. My wife will say amen. I am a time management freak. I am, all right? I've shared this before. I believe my two spiritual gifts are the gift of administration, which is organization and preaching. Some of you may differ with the first one, but you all agree with the second one, amen? <laughs> right? But here's, here's because I, I like organization and time management, I'm, I'm serious guys, when, when, I was, when I was 14 years old, the greatest gift I ever got from my mother on my birthday was a Franklin Templeton planner. 
Here's why she gifted that to me, because she worked at MCI at that time, and, and that's what they gave all of their managers. But, but guys, I would, I would wear sticky notes out with, with every detail of the morning before I even started school, like, get up. That's what I had on my sticky note. Right after that, brush teeth. Right after that, shower. I, every detail down to the second. And it was revolutionary when I got the Franklin planner. And then, and then, and then we went digital, right? I got a PDA. Some of you are like, what is that? Right? And, then, and, now, and now, and now, listen, the, the world's jumped on board. The world wants to be like me. Now we got smartphones that have everything that you need. It's a mini computer in your hand for organization. iCal is my best friend right behind Ginger. (laughs) But of all the time management courses and curriculum and books that I have read and seen, here's something that's strange to me as I've learned this. It says this, that if I want to change my schedule then they all point to this. I've got to make the time. Make the time. Some of them even say you gotta make more time. And and I gotta be honest with you, all right, as I've lived through the years a little bit, okay? Um, That has got to be the dumbest thought process that I have ever come across in my life. You know why? Because I can't make time. I can't. Why? Because it's already been made. Time has already been made. The only thing that I can do is become a better manager of the time that's already been given to me by God. That's the only thing I can do. So you gotta understand from the get-go, making time, if that's what you're trying to do with your life and your disorganization, making time is bad theology. It's really, really bad theology. Let me show you what I mean in Genesis chapter 114, if you're doubting this today. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. You know what that means? That means that God is the author of time. God designed time. You, you didn't des- design time. You, you can't make time. And you can't, you can't uh, uh, create more time. It's already been made. Jesus also said in Matthew 6, 27, who of you, who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? Oh gosh, this will preach today, won't it? You know what that's basically mean? It means worrying about getting more time doesn't give you any more time. How many of us waste time worrying about time? Right? How many of you have ever said this before? I wish I had more time in the day. Raise your hands, you're liars, you're in church. Every single one of us has said this at one point in our life. You all went to school when the final exam was coming up. I wish I had more time in my day. Can I give you a word today? If you have said that before, I'm gonna get a little brutal right now. I'm going to give you a word today. If you have ever said that in your life, I wish I had more time in the day. Ready? Blasphemy. All of us are blasphemers. Blasphemy. Because blasphemy is when, listen, listen, I'm going to back this up. Blasphemy is when we think we have a better idea of how the day should be spent than God. But for some reason, somewhere along our way, we've all convinced ourselves one time or another that we have a better idea about time than what God originally came up with. If you are too busy with your 365 days of 24 hours gifts from God, there's something wrong with you. Something wrong that's really, really bad. 
And that's something that's wrong is not God, it's you. So you gotta understand folks, that if you're busy, which I don't doubt that you are, life in my generation, in my time has just sped up and sped up and sped up. It does not slow for any reason whatsoever. But I'm here to tell you that if you're busy or too busy, ready? It's your choice. See, because I promise you that when God created the gift of 24, he had 2019 in mind and realized how fast our culture and society would become. And, and, and I'm, can you just imagine the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit having a little conversation about this? Like, should we do this really? Because it's gonna get busy down the road. You know what I'm saying? Should we, should we, should we add a little bit? No, can you, can you imagine this? No, 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 they said, it's plenty of time. It's plenty of time. Their choice will be whether or not they choose to be busy or not. Busyness is choice. And I'm telling you, there is no greater barrier to prayer than busyness. This, this week, Ginger and I started our annual next group, which we have a selective process of teenagers that, that apply through Celebration Youth to be a part of the next group, which is basically a, a chance in which Ginger and I spend six to eight weeks with just like 10 to 12 teenagers. We just take that time out of the beginning of the year. Every single teenager in a conversation and discussion that we had was, we were talking about the barriers of your relationship with Jesus Christ. Every single one of them kept going back to time time. Now listen, I bit my tongue with 16, 17, and 18 year olds telling me they're too busy. <laughs> but I did, I did emphasize whether or not you have time is your choice. I said to them, you don't need next group. You don't need celebration. You, you, you don't need revive. You, you don't need Hume summer camp. Do you know what you need? You need to choose to spend time with Jesus. So, so then when, when, when these things come along, because they're not bad, this book is not bad that you read. None of this stuff is, but they're just compasses. They're just compasses. The compasses do nothing for you except point you in the direction that you need to go. They're reminders that God gave you a gift of 24 and you choose what you're gonna do with it. Philippians 4, six through seven, tells us something about being impatient with time in our lives. It's probably one of the most famous prayer verses there are, but, but it, it speaks to how the value of prayer is vital to our daily success. Listen to this, it says this, do not what? Do not be anxious. How many of you are already screwed in this message because we just said anxious? <laughs> Do not be anxious. Let's go ahead and just add injury to insult. About anything. Any of you got a 16 year old that's driving you crazy? Any of you got a problem a job and you, at your work and you don't know if you're gonna actually have a job at the end of tomorrow? Any of you are like, I don't know how I'm gonna pay the bills at the end of the month. I don't know if my marriage is gonna keep going. Do not be anxious about any, all, all of that stuff. How many of us have violated that verse already today? Oh, look at you, you're raising your hands. Thank you very much. Now I got people's attention. You're in it now, aren't you? Like I'm in deep, I'm screwed today. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I've said this before, and I am a violator of this principle more than ever, but Ginger and I can tell you this, we got a few things in our life that are just overwhelming right now, overwhelming. But we have applied this principle 
better than we ever have in, other rela- in, in our other issues in our life this year. But I've said this, how many of you pray about your mountain, your problem more than you talk about your prayer or about your problem to somebody else? How many of you talk about your mountain over and over and over with your spouse more than you do pray about it? See, if you really put yourself to that test, you're going to realize really quick how out of whack your prayer life is, especially if this verse is true. And we have, we've, we've applied that. Have, has, the, has the mountain changed, Josh? No, the mountain is still big and it seems to be growing every single day. But you know what we have experienced more than we've ever experienced before? An intimate relationship with Jesus and an intimate relationship with one another that we've never experienced before in our lives. We don't feel so alone. We don't feel so isolated in the shadow of our mountain that we have in times past. I guess what I'm basically saying today is this. Prayer doesn't happen on the run. And the truth is, you and I, as a follower of Jesus, we're too busy not to pray. We're too busy not to pray. Our conversations with God, our conversations with God should actually sound something like this. God, God, would you give me the wisdom that is greater than my own on how to spend today? Because if it's left up to me and my own wisdom, I'm gonna screw it up like I did yesterday. And you're well aware of that because I'll be too busy tomorrow just like I was too busy today. So I beg you, God, I beg you, help me be a better manager of today. Show me what you have for me today. How would you like me to live this adventure that you have blessed me with and called me on? And then after you pray that, you don't wanna know what you need to do? You wanna know what you need to do? Here's what you need to do. You need to pause. Ginger's favorite words, be still. You need to shut your trap. Stop talking. Admit everything that you are wrong. Give God all the glory for him being right. And then shut up. Shut up. And pause. Pause. Here's why. Because pausing, guys, pausing is vital. It is vital to your prayer life. It is Huge, it is instrumental. How do we know this? Because Jesus paused. Look at this in Mark chapter one, 35 through 37. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up. Huh. Left the house and went to a solitary place where he prayed. And isn't this so typical? Because this is, this, is this is us right here. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everybody's looking for you. Where'd you go? I just love this passage. It says, Jesus' friends go after, they're, they're sleeping still. They're sleeping still, right? And Jesus is like, I need to pause and I need to spend time with Jesus today because I've got a gift of 24. And I need to make sure that I prioritize my time right and I'm a good steward of it because today there's gonna be tons of people that want me and my attention. So I need to dedicate this time to my father. So they show up and says, Jesus, uh, everybody's looking for you. Where have you been, Jesus? Come on, dude. Come on, we've been trying to call you on your cell phone. Are you kidding me, Jesus? We got you a cell phone for this exact reason. Is it, Peter's probably, give me that thing. Is it even on? Come on. We set ringtones for each one of us. Oh, I see what it is. Judas called you and you just didn't pay attention. Are you screening your calls, Jesus? Listen, guys, we, 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 we've got, we've 
got to take the time daily to pause and beg God for his cure for our compulsion, compulsion to be busy. And if you're wondering why that's so necessary, let let me tell you, it's because our busyness, it keeps our prayers very limited. What do you mean by that? It keeps them to this level. Jesus, thanks for this lunch. I appreciate you providing it for me today. It keeps your prayers tame. It keeps your prayers controlled. Our busyness is keeping our prayers modest. It's keeping our prayers tempered. It's keeping your prayers impossible. And Jesus actually has something to say about impossibilities. If that's how your prayer life is. Matthew chapter 21, 21 through 22, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. If you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but you can also say to that mountain, go throw yourself into the sea. And guess what? It will be done. I get chills when I read this. I also get a lot of shame in thinking how I have been given a gift of faith and prayer and how little I tend to use it. I, I, I believe this. I, I really believe that many of us are going to see Jesus and we will receive glory. We will receive heaven and we will rejoice and be worshiping him all the time. But I do believe many, many, many people who follow Jesus Christ that are called Christians, born again believers in Jesus, are gonna be ashamed at the power in which they had at their fingertips and they never used. We raised $25,000 in four weeks, four weeks for a future building fund, for faith, for something that we we can't see. We, We just know we got land. We don't know when we're gonna get it. We don't even know where it is. But we said, hey, listen, we wanna start a building fund and we raised $25,000. That's power to raise that in four weeks. But when we say tithe, we struggle sometimes from week to week, even meeting what our budgetary need is. Because faith is applied to giving 10%. It has to be. Because some of us are like, there's no way, 10%, no way. No, what is faith? Faith should be something that looks at something that is impossible, but only with God, it becomes possible. This isn't even a generosity series. We'll talk about that in a few weeks. I once heard this said, fear will cause you to sit around and make up scenarios that could happen. However, faith will cause you to fully engage in things that should happen. So I guess the real question today for us is, because you won't be able to go any farther with today's conversation and your prayer life if you can't answer this question first. Do you really believe that your impossibilities are actually possible? Because if you can't say no, I don't, that then you will have limited faith. You will have limited faith. But the question is, do you really believe that your impossibilities are possible? 
And, and if you can't answer that question confidently, now listen, this is not the Jesus response. I don't want you to, absolutely, yeah, I do, yeah. Okay, all right, then I'm gonna bring to you some bigger, bigger, bigger mountain prayer requests and responses for you to respond to for our church. So be careful in how you answer that. But I'm gonna tell you this, if you honestly, and I appreciate your honesty, if you say, I, I don't, in all of them, I, I, I don't. I don't, I'll be honest. Great, that's the first step is just acknowledging your little faith. It doesn't mean that you can't grow your faith into another level, which is awesome news. But here's what I want you to understand. If you question your impossibilities becoming possible, I want you to understand something. You serve a God that in scripture it says, nothing, absolutely nothing is impossible for God. No, don't you say amen unless you believe it. We serve a God who says nothing is impossible for God. So according to Luke chapter 137, we should pray big, ask big, believe big, because apparently our God is big, right? So with all of that established this morning, there's my introduction. Praise the Lord. I haven't preached for a few weeks. I'm getting warmed up. I'll, I'll, I'll wrap this up quickly. Let me share with you really quick a few ways that you can start praying mountain moving prayers. How you can start praying impossibilities possible. How can I, how can I begin praying impossibilities possible? Number one, number one, ready? If you're a note taker, you wanna write this down. Faith, faith it, all, it all establishes with your faith, okay? Faith comes from looking at God and not your mountain. Okay, okay, starts here. You've got to somehow shift your focus off of your mountain and onto your God. You, you have to. And let's be honest, let, we've already admitted kind of, you know, intentionally, we focus on the things and we worry about it, we worry about it, right? How and how much we pray for it versus how much we talk about it. Seriously, all of your focus is on your mountain. All of it's on your mountain and, you're, and, and, and the problem that's in front of you. And you have got to start shifting your focus off of your mountain and on to God. The really, listen, the real reason many of our prayers are weak is because many of us have weak faith. You, you, need, you need to somehow move in your relationship with God to where you stop agreeing with the doctrine of God's omnipotence and you need to start owning it. You need to start owning it. Listen, I, I'm serious because many of us default to this. I've had so many conversations like, yeah, that was a Bible story. That, there's no way that could have happened. Are you kidding me? My Bible says that God is immutable. Do you know what immutability means? It means he don't change. He's still the God today. He's still the God yesterday as he was back then. And he'll be the same God tomorrow. Our God is immutable and you've got to stop believing and, or, or agreeing with God's immutability and start, and start uh, professing it and believing. Listen, Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Isaiah 4, 20, uh, 40, 28, do you not know? Have you not heard? I love that. Are you an idiot? I mean, just add that, Isaiah. The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary and his understanding no one can fathom. And if that's true, if that's true, when I lack faith, then I need to claim the faith that's available to me that only comes through God. Anybody, anybody remember the old hymn? Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. You know what I'm talking about? Oh God. My father, I'm not gonna stop singing because my voice is gonna crack. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not, thy compassions they fail not. And thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Don't you love the old hymns? Those are so cool. I, we're gonna, 
We're going to do a series in the next year called Hymns. So I, we are. It's already on. Quit chuckling. We're going to do it. And we're going to take a, a few of the hymns, and, 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 and it's, it's old-fashioned Sundays. All my seasoned folks are going to love those days. I like it. Um, there may be a little revision, a little twist with today's generation, but we're going to talk about some of those hymns and why they were written and the importance and value in them. But anyway, our best place, our best place to stop, to start focusing more on him and stop focusing on, on you is, is, uh, uh, is on your barriers, on your obstacles, on your inexperiences, on your weaknesses, on your confusion, on your impossibilities, on your mountain and your inability to move them. Here's why, friends, here's why. Because... You need to hear this. This is truth. God doesn't see mountains. He doesn't. You know what God sees? He only sees one thing. He sees his plans to use you to move mountains. That's all God sees. Here's the second one. Ready? When your mountain doesn't seem to be moving, can I get an amen? Because you got one. When your mountain doesn't seem to be moving, that may mean that God wants you to actually go through it. Ugh! Are you serious? Yep. Why? Because going through a mountain sometimes increases your face more than moving it. Oh, that was good. And that just came to me. It's not even in my notes right there. That's good. It was really good. Joshua chapter 3. It's a great Old Testament story that illustrates this principle. This is kind of my, my last point um, about going through mountains. The Israelites were camped. Man, I keep putting my hand in my pocket for some reason today. I feel so astute and, and studious. I'm just like, come on. It's sweaty. Ginger told me it was really cold in here last week. Was it really cold? I wore a sweatshirt today. Joshua chapter 3. Great story that illustrates this principle about going through mountains. Israelites were camped on the bank of the Jordan River at a crossroads, at a crossroads, asking question ever question, do we ever, do we ever, are we ever going to take the promised land? How do, how do we now cross this river? Are you kidding me? It's one obstacle after the next, even though they're the ones that brought on a lot of the obstacles, Right? despite having miraculously escaped from Egypt after hundreds and hundreds of years of slavery, just 40 short years, 40 years paled in comparison to generation after generation of generation in slavery. And they're like, gosh, here we are again. Here we are again. An entire generation later, and they've been wandering around in the wilderness because of their lack of faith. Even though God met every single one of their needs in their disobedience. Can I say that again? God met all of their needs even though they were disobedient. And you question God's compassion sometimes. And you question his mercy. Chances are you're the one that got yourself in the position that you're in. And now you're mad at God? Well, what's a good thing that he's given me, Josh? He, I don't know, just a chance back for restoration. That's a pretty good thing. How many times do we just miss every day miracles? That's a miracle. They reach the promised land in their sights, but they, they have this huge, and one more, one more obstacle and problem in front of us, big mountain in front of us. It's called the Jordan River. And to make matters worse, it's flood season. The banks are overflowing. And, and, and that makes all the, the usual crossing areas, the shallower ground, pretty much uncrossable. And we all know that what the Bible has to say, you know, and, and it's an easy default answer. Cause like I said, but we've already cleared up the whole misconceptions that God is immutable. He's the same then as he is today. So, but the, the answer is, well, that's okay. God parted the, the Red Sea and he can easily part the Jordan River, 
right? But let me ask you something really, really serious with that statement. How often do we say that God can do something when we know more believe that he really will? So here's what God does. He gives Joshua some strange orders. He says, number one, have the people watch the Ark of the Covenant. When they see the priests carrying it, uh, they need to fall in behind it. And then Joshua tells the people key words in this story, uh, which I love and they often get overlooked. But he says, he says this, when they look at the Ark of the Covenant, tell the people to expect, expect, expect expect amazing things to happen. When you pray about your mountain, do you expect amazing things to happen? Now it's probably a good time for me to remind you what faith actually means in the biblical definition sense. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. Thanks for that one. Please don't miss this point, friends. Our faith is based, your faith is based on expecting amazing things to happen. It is based on expecting impossibilities to become possible. It is based on expecting your mountains to move. Back to our story, Joshua then tells his priest number three, carry the ark and go stand in the river. And my question right here is, what is it? What is the one thing that God is asking you to do right now? And then ask yourself, when is the last time that I started walking towards it? Like he told me to go. Do you even have the courage to take a step? Do you even have the, have you even taken a step? Now you need to know something very important right here. These priests, they weren't even alive. Many of them weren't even alive when their grandparents and parents crossed the Red Sea. They'd spent their whole lives in the desert. And what do we know ourselves, right, about living in the desert, right? Here's what we do know. There's one thing that is true for all of us that live here in Arizona. There's not a lot of water in the desert. There just isn't, right? So my point is, since they've been wandering around in the desert for 40 years, there's probably something that they're not too comfortable with, and that's cold water, a.k.a. swimming, swimming. Watch what happens in Joshua chapter 3, 15 through 17. Now the Jordan is at its flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, check this out, the water from upstream stopped flowing. Do you see what's happening here? The mountain is beginning to move. Something that is absolutely impossible that this generation of Israelites did not see. They didn't see the Red Sea part. They just heard stories about it. Yeah, that's cute and all. You didn't see the Red Sea part. You just hear us preach about it. And you're like, that's awesome. That's cute and all. But some of us have never lived with a mountain moving experience in our life. And shame on us. They begin to see something that God said happened and did way back when. Can you imagine what their faith level went to? It's like their faith meter. I believe. It stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away around a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan, while the water flowing down the Sea of Arabah, the Salt Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan. Are you freaking kidding me? While all of Israel passed by until the whole nation had completely crossed over, not on muddy ground, not on soggy ground, on dry ground. See, this is that thing in which I read, I read into the Bible of this kind of stuff, you know what I'm saying? Like little fish flopping around and all that. No! See, that's what you and I would think. They would walk. That's how, no! No, because our God can do exceedingly abundantly things beyond what you could ever dream, think, or imagine. No, dry ground. No, we're not talking about sloshy ground. There's sandals, they had to clean their sandals off. No, dry ground. 
Now here's something really important to know. Did you know that God never once gave the priests any type of indication or evidence that the waters were gonna part? Get this point. God did nothing for them until they took the first step. Somehow, if, if you want that prayer life, you've got to begin shifting your focus off of the size of the mountain that stands in front of you onto the sufficiency of the mountain mover. Have you ever stood so long, so long? It seems like for some of us lifetimes, have you ever stood so long in the shadow of the mountain in your life that you've grown accustomed to the darkness? Do you ever end your prayers of like, I, I got a little bit of faith left, but then end it with what's the use? God's not gonna do this. He hasn't done it for 20 years. If that's you today, I got some advice for you, ready? Stop spending all of your time describing your mountain to the Lord. Trust, stop, stop. Stop. He already knows the size of your mountain. And learn how to shift your focus off of your mountain under the mountain mover. And whenever you begin to doubt, which I'm sure you were, well, because we, we've got something in our life. Gingers, kidney stones, you, you know the story. We've had that and we've had some moments of weak faith. But when those times come, here's, here's what keeps us going. The God I am praying to about a mountain, his son rose from the dead. No, 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 no. Are you scattering, smattering applause? Are you kidding me, people? How many of you have seen somebody raised from the dead? God's son, Jesus Christ, rose from the dead. And you are praying to that God, that God. That's the God you're praying to. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Listen, I, I'm, I'm, I'm completely blown away with, with what God has been willing to do for me. We're talking about the greatest impossibility of all time becoming possible. God sent his only son, to die a sinner's death on a cross that was intended for you and me. And then three days later, he beats death. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? And he restores a broken relationship with you and me. He provides us with a gift of eternal life. Shortly after the last supper, uh, um, uh, the communion that we celebrate and the symbolism of that in the last moments, here's what's so cool. Ginger kind of alluded to it in her second Sunday, but, but here's what's awesome. Right after the, the last supper, what does Jesus do? Like his last actions on this earth. He prays, he prays. John chapter 17, he prays to himself. He prays for his disciples. And then here's the cool part that you don't even realize. He prays for you. He prays for you. Go look it up in verses 20 through 26. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Jesus communicates to his disciples how important it is to continue remembering what they were about to see him do. And then the very next thing he does, he goes and prays. And here's what I, I get with that. He's about to move the greatest mountain known to mankind. That's the barrier between you and him if you don't have a relationship. And Jesus realizes that prayer is the preparation for mountain moving. We're gonna celebrate today and we're gonna communicate 
I mean, we're gonna celebrate um, communion today and remember what Jesus did for us. So here's what I want you to do. Before you take the bread and juice, before you come to this stage, if you wanna sign up for a prayer team, so that's cool. You wanna know where to get that 21 days prayer. It's up at the stage. But before you come up here, I just want you to do these two things. I want you to put the backdrop of the cross. Behind your mountain. That you're facing. Whatever it is, and it could be massive. I'm not doubting that. I just want you to put the backdrop of the cross behind your mountain. And I want you to start praying and believing unthinkable, unimaginable, and impossible prayers today. And that you would look at your mountain, but the size of the cross behind your mountain is greater. And you would begin to believe and you would begin to expect amazing things to happen. Would you stand with me? I'm gonna pray for us. And then you can come to the stage and take the communion, the elements, the bread and the juice today. Please take it on stage. We're kind of required to do that here at the facility. But don't come forward until you can feel confident about making sure that the cross is bigger than your mountain. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, I would be remiss to invite you to come forward today. We'll have some more prayer team counselors at the front just standing here and just tell them, I don't think I even have a relationship with Jesus Christ. We'd love to introduce you to him today. Would you have the courage to do that? All right, let me pray for us and we'll, we'll celebrate communion. Jesus, we love you. We praise you. Thank you. Thank you for giving us prayer. Gosh, thank you. I pray for this body of believers faith level that it would go to areas unseen, unimaginable. Help someone today, Lord, through taking communion, celebrating, gosh, the biggest mountain moving experience known to mankind. You rose from the dead. Oh my gosh. Are you kidding me? And that's what we're remembering today. What we're remembering is there is no mountain too big to move. That's what we're remembering. So help somebody, God. Help somebody increase the size of the cross so it'll decrease the size of their mountain. We love you. We praise you in your son's holy and precious name. And all God's people said, you're welcome to come forward.